Hello, I'm Jackson King, and today we're going to talk, be talking about arguably the most successful documentarian of all time. Michael Moore was born in Flint, Michigan in 1954. His parents, Veronica, a secretary, and Frank, an assembly line worker, raised him Irish Catholic. From a young age, fed his never-ending hunger for knowledge. My mother had made the mistake of teaching me to read and write by the time I was four, so I was already doomed at that point <laughs> as soon as I entered school. And, and also, uh, as I remember it, it was asking questions was an okay thing in our household. Uh, so as a, as a little tyke, uh, that, was, that, the, the, that was not put out. The, the, the flame of that was not uh, uh, extinguished. So, <clears throat> my mother's idea of a summer vacation was not to take us up to the lake uh, to go you know, fishing and swimming and, and all that. Uh, she uh, convinced my dad that uh, um, we should go to Washington, D.C. or Civil War battlefields or <clears throat> places like that to learn American history. So she'd load us kids in the car. We'd drive from Flint, Michigan, down to, to the, uh, our nation's capital, where we would spend days at the National Archives reading the documents, <laughs> or at the Smithsonian, uh, walking through all their exhibits, um, and taking us up to Capitol Hill, because <clears throat> she thought it was important for us to meet our elected representatives from Michigan. So one day, we're in the Capitol building, and I got separated uh, from them. And um, I'm wandering around, and I'm, I'm 11 years old, and I, then I start to realize I'm never going to see my parents again. And so I, I just I see an elevator, the doors open, I walk into this elevator, I'm, you know, I'm in tears. And uh, there's a man reading the newspaper in the elevator. The doors close, he hears this little boy crying, he puts the paper down, I turn around, it's Bobby Kennedy. And he's like, what's, what's wrong, young man? And, and uh, I lost my mommy. <laughs> so he, uh, he, we got off the elevator, and he took me to go find my mommy. Uh, and uh, he ran into a Capitol Police officer. And the officer said, that's OK, Senator. We'll take it from here. And he said, no, no I'll, I'll, I'll stay with him until we, you, know, you find the mother. And he stayed there and comforted me and, and uh, had this conversation with him. And it was, uh, it was a very sweet thing uh, for him to do. It's something that just, you know, I held for many years after that. Uh, not only did Moore's parents support his young ambition, but his uncle Laverne, the head of the United Automobile Workers Union, also served as a fantastic role model. These positive influences contributed to, at the mere age of 18, while still enrolled in school, Moore became one of the youngest elected officials in the history of the United States as a member of the Flint, Michigan School Board. Right, right after 18-year-olds got the right to vote, um, I, um, I was still a senior in high school, and I we had this very um, brutal vice principal um, who carried this wooden board around and gave swats uh, to students whenever he felt like it. And, and he gave it to me one day, made me bend over because my shirt tail was out. You had to have your shirt tucked in back then. And um, I was just so upset. I went home and, uh, and I saw in the paper that uh, two school board members were retiring and there was going to be an election in June. And I, I started thinking, geez, I wonder if I could run for office and be this guy's boss. So I called the county clerk and found out I could run. Um, I got the required number of signatures. And, well, my first, the first position on my platform was to get the vice principal fired. <laughs> For the, like the last week of school, I was, I was one of his bosses and I was under fear of being hit with that board. <laughs> so it was an odd, it was an odd situation. And frankly, it was very, um, I had quite an epiphany in line for graduation, uh, in my high school graduation. We was, it was the night of uh, uh, June 17th, 1972, which coincidentally was also the night of the Watergate uh, break-in. Um, but we didn't know anything about that because we were just in line for graduation. And um, uh, boys had to wear a tie under their gown. So this vice principal, he's going down the line, you know, checking under everybody's gown to make sure they have a tie on. And this kid in front of me, um, uh, the assistant principal stops and he goes, where's your tie? And he says, oh, I have a tie. And he had one of those string ties, Bolero. <clears throat> and uh, he says, uh, this is a tie. And he said, this is not a tie. And he yanks the kid, physically <clears throat> takes him out of the line and says, you're not graduating. And he's going, but Mr. Ryan, and he says, out. And he just takes the kid and just out 
to the door. And that was it. 12 years of going to school and the kid couldn't graduate because he had on the wrong kind of tie. But the real um, thing that, that bothered me about that wasn't so much what Mr. Ryan did to this student, but that I stood there. And I had just been elected five days earlier to the Board of Education. I stood there and said nothing. After high school, Moore's college career was short-lived. And after only one semester, he dropped out of the University of Michigan, Flint. At the age of 22, despite not owning a college degree, Moore founded a weekly magazine to discuss pressing issues in Flint and named that magazine The Flint Voice. Um, oh, geez, I was uh, 22, uh, something like that. And uh, I, um, I mean, I've always loved journalism. And uh, I, I started my, actually, I started my first newspaper when I was in fourth grade. Well, then I started The Flint Voice, and, the, and uh, we did a story on the mayor and how he was having um, uh, city employees campaign for him on city time, and he was using federal funds to pay these employees, uh, essentially to campaign uh, for him. And so um, uh, we did a story on it. He wanted to know where we got the story, and uh, we wouldn't tell him. And so he sent the police uh, to our printer, which was at another newspaper, and they, with, a, with a search warrant from, signed by a judge went in there and seized everything to do with our paper, including the printing plates right off the, from the press. And uh, uh, it was just a shocking, shocking thing. And it, and it, it, it became national news. And then a, a few months later, um, there was another newsroom raid out in Boise, Idaho, uh, of a CBS affiliate, where they went to snatch some videotapes of a demonstration. After these two incidents with my paper and the, and the, the local TV station in Boise, um, a number of congressmen got behind and then passed a newsroom shield law that uh, prohibited police from going into newsrooms to seize things. Uh, that, and, and that became the law of the land. Jimmy Carter signed it. Uh, and, and it had its, uh, its origins in part uh, from this raid that occurred in Flint, Michigan with my little paper. Later, Moore expanded the magazine to cover all of Michigan and changed the name to The Michigan Voice. After abandoning his creation in 1986, Moore joined the well-known liberal magazine, Mother Jones. Moore's stint at the Mother Jones was also a quick one, as he was fired after only four months with the magazine. The Mother Jones claimed to, f to have fired him for refusing to print an article on human rights in Nigeria which Moore called an example of the worst kind of patronizing BS. Moore, however, believed that he was fired because the magazine did not want him printing an article on the General Motors plant in Flint closing, but he did anyway. Following a lengthy wrongful termination suit, Moore was awarded $58,000. Using the money he won in the suit, Moore made his first documentary, Roger and Me on the very topic that got him fired from Mother Jones. Roger, in the film, is former GM chairman Roger Smith. And the documentary follows Moore's many failed attempts to get an interview with Smith about the globalization of General Motors, closing their Flint plant in favor of a less expensive one in Mexico. The documentary was revered as both powerful and moving, winning an Emmy in 1989. Although it was very popular, Moore's style was controversial and met its fair share of critics. One such naysayer was renowned film critic Pauline Kael, who criticized the film for over-exaggerating the actual impact the move had on the citizens of Flint and rearranging the order of clips to confuse viewers, making them believe that incidents shown in the film happened before the plant's closing. After receiving such acclaim for his work, Moore, undeterred by his opposition, decided to go down an entirely different route. In 1995, Moore produced Canadian Bacon, a scripted comedy about a fictional U.S. invasion of Canada. Good evening. Edwin S. Simon reporting. NBS News has obtained Pentagon documents that show our neighbor to the north 
the sovereign nation of Canada has embarked on a military program aimed at the United States. Canada, known for ages as a polite and clean country, has, under a socialist majority, undertaken a massive military buildup on its border with the United States. In 2002, Moore came out with possibly his most influential documentary of all time, Academy Award winner for Best Documentary Feature, Bowling for Columbine. Bowling for Columbine centered around the gun crisis in America, focusing on the violent culture of the United States, causing tens of thousands of gun deaths every year. Can I help you? Uh, yeah, I'm here to open up an account. Okay, what type of account would you like? Um, yeah, I want the account where I can uh, get the uh, free gun. Okay. I'd spotted an ad in the local Michigan paper that said if you opened an account at North Country Bank, the bank would give you a gun. You do a CD no, and we'll hand you. hand you a gun. We have a whole brochure here that you can look at. Mm -hmm. Although also a very powerful documentary, it met backlash for the propaganda-like nature of the film. Representatives from the branch, Moore filmed his well-known free gun bank account scene, say, say he misled them to bend their policies for film on unique businesses in America. Also, Matt Stone, the producer and writer for South Park, harbors ill feelings about the cartoon, A Brief History of the United States of America. Both Stone and his fellow South Park producer, Trey Parker, feel that that cartoon was done in a style very similar to their own. And this, combined with the proximity of Stone's interview in the documentary, may have led some viewers to believe, incorrectly, that they had created the cartoon. As a sort of cruel payback, both Moore's documentary style and Moore's personality were attacked in Stone and Parker's 2004 film, Team America World Police. I am making a documentary that exposes the truth behind this fascist team. You, look in the lens and say, Team America killed my mother. Team America killed my mother. Yeah! yeah. Now say, now say, Team America ate my baby. What? Say it! Team America ate my baby! Yeah! Yeah! Down with the fascists! Down with the fascists! <laughs> <laughs> Although all of his films have a deeply political message, Moore rejects the title of political activist, saying, I and you and everyone else has to be a political activist. If we're not politically active, it ceases to be democracy. Being said, Moore has appeared on many political shows advocating the views of the far left. But in all seriousness, look, you're a talented movie maker. You have a left-wing point of view. You don't apologize for it. I'm not, I'm going to give you credit for that. Right. Because I think you're an unapologetic socialist, however you want to describe yourself. Fair? And, ev and was even a guest speaker at both the 2004 Democratic and Republican national conventions. Moore's political views were strong enough, in fact, to warrant an entire film. Michael Moore Hates America is a 2004 film directed by Michael Wilson, a libertarian who, like Moore, was born in Flint, Michigan, that attempts to discredit many of Moore's findings, pointing out some of the many flaws in Moore's filmmaking and how he misinterprets truth for the use of propaganda. Wilson points out how Moore stages events such as the gun bank scene in Bowling for Columbine and how by cutting scenes, Moore distorts the truth, such as his cutting of Charlton Heston's speech also in Bowling for Columbine. Michael Wilson is making a movie about you, just like you and Roger, you, him, and Michael Moore. He wants to talk to you. Will you give him an interview? Will you talk to him? Oh, I don't, I don't be, I'm not in anybody else's movies other than my own. That's not true! I know just what you are. Some brand of pathetic superstar. Who are you? Giving improper information. And then you take that, you take that line, and you put it within a proscenium, and it's instantly art. Michael Moore is certainly a controversial political figure. Yet whether you agree with his views or not, the impact he has made is undeniable. Not many documentarians can claim to have feature-length films made condemning their beliefs. Not only did Michael Moore become the world's most successful documentarian, but he did it while enraging half the United States at the same time. Moore's ability to not only present information proving his point, 
but also hold audiences captive on the edge of their seats with his humor when dis discussing what some would consider to be dull topics, set an example for future filmmakers all over the world. Moore's in-depth reporting has brought attention to many crucial issues facing America and the world today. I'm Jackson King and thank you very much for watching.